You know, I've played quite a few Souls-likes in my time. Every time I have thoroughly beaten a From Software Souls game, Souls-likes would bridge the gap until the next proper Souls game releases. There's just something about starting with essentially nothing and being pitted against unimaginable horrors or corrupt gods eventually coming out on top. It seems straightforward enough, but there's a delicate balance that has to be achieved in order to make a good Souls-like. In today's breakdowns, yes, plural, I'm looking at Lords of the Fallen and Lies of P, two recent Souls-likes that show up and show out, respectively. Oh, holy Aureus, by your radiance grant me the strength to continue to endure these dark days to lay bare the path to salvation for my wayward brothers and sisters, so we may walk it together and to strike down all those who would see our will defied. Oh. As always, to understand the state of the game, we've got to peel back the curtain and have a look at the people that brought it to us, starting with the developers of Lords of the Fallen. This might get confusing. Way back in December 2014, the executive producer of the first Lords of the Fallen, Tomas Gopp, confirmed the development of a sequel to the game, which was dubbed Lords of the Fallen 2 for the time being. In May 2015, Polish game developer CI Games announced that the game would be released in 2017 and confirmed that German game developer Deck 13 Interactive, the lead developer of the first game, would not be involved. In 2017, Gop revealed that Lords of the Fallen 2 was still nothing more than a concept, and that CI Games has significantly reduced the development team along with the scope of the game itself, following the underwhelming release of Sniper Ghost Warrior 3. In 2018, CI Games declared that New York-based developer Defiant Studios would lead Lords of the Fallen 2's development, and that they would clean slate the development in order to start from scratch. However, CI Games must have been having second thoughts because just one year later, CI Games terminated its contract with Defiant, deeming their work on the game thus far to be inadequate. In 2020, CI Games then founded a subsidiary, Hexworks, and set them to task working on the game. The game was officially revealed by CI Games during Gamescom 2022, renamed as THE Lords of the Fallen. It was then rebranded as simply Lords of the Fallen in March 2023 in order to properly reflect the game's status as a reboot. To give you a sense of just how ambitious Hexworks was, executive producer Saul Gaskin basically said the studio's objective was to be the second reference for the Soulsborne genre. A lofty goal to be sure. To minimize confusion, I'm going to call the game Lords of the Fallen 2 for the remainder of this video. Now, I feel that a Souls-like should be able to borrow the general structure of a true Souls game and build upon it in order to establish its own identity. Deck 13's The Surge is a great example. It took the high difficulty, semi-open world, complete with sparse checkpoints, area shortcuts, and a plethora of weapons and armor to choose from, and draped it in a corporatized sci-fi aesthetic that also incorporates that feeling of hopelessness and despair through the game's many subplots and the overall atmosphere that you'd expect from a proper Soulsborne title. I remember the first Lords of the Fallen was one of the PlayStation Plus free games from September 2016. I was much less discerning about what games I played back then, but I knew one thing for sure. Lords of the Fallen did not look to be worth any amount of money. Naturally, when I got the game for free, I figured I had nothing to lose, so I gave it a go. I recognized that the game was rough and unpolished, but I still enjoyed it for what it was. In Lords of the Fallen 2, all the Dark Souls staples are present. Choose a class to start the game as, which determines your starting level, stats, weapons, armor, accessories, and items. Learn the basics of the game through fighting a handful of enemies, and use those basics to beat one or two bosses before making it to the main hub of the game. After that, gain a base understanding of the abysmal state of the world and what you're going to do about it. Exploring for new weapons, armor, and items, fighting small monsters, big monsters, and gigantic monsters, all of which pose roughly the same amount of threat to your livelihood, and learning their attack patterns through many straight-up unwarranted or aggravating deaths. Eventually, through sweat, tears, and all the cursing you've done at your TV, the skills you develop both as the player and as your character will be enough to get you to the grand finale, where you fight the most imposing boss thus far. <laughs> Lastly, you finally complete the game and feel a positively refreshing sense of accomplishment and a well-deserved sense of smug superiority wash over you. Then you enter New Game Plus and do it all again. 
As far as the aesthetic and atmosphere, Lords of the Fallen 2 is very much knights and magic with a modest dose of body horror, and a once proud kingdom now reduced to rubble and overrun with unholy abominations, and I'm very much on board with that. Style-wise, it sits somewhere between blasphemous and agony. So, what sets the game apart from other Souls-likes? One mechanic that stands above all else in the game is the Umbral Lantern. The Umbral Lantern is essentially a doorway. On one side is Axiom, the physical plane, where you spend most of your time by default. On the other side is Umbral, the death plane, and your understanding of the two worlds is crucial to making it anywhere in the game. In Axiom, things operate as you'd expect a Souls game to. Explore, kill enemies, and find items. When you cross into Umbral, whether you wanted to or because you died while in Axiom, you'll encounter all the enemies that are still alive in Axiom on top of the enemies that only exist in Umbral and the additional enemies that will spawn while you are in Umbral. Basically, the longer you stay in Umbral, the more frequently additional enemies will spawn and the more dangerous these additional enemies will be. If you stay for too long, something called the Crimson Ritual will begin where some overpowered enemy in red robes will pursue you no matter how far you go and attempt to forcefully remove you from Umbral, as in kill you. When you die, you respawn at the nearest ancient vestige, this game's equivalent of a bonfire, and your vigor, this game's equivalent of souls, is left with the enemy that killed you. Fortunately, you can make good use of the Axiom Umbral transition during boss battles, since you'll essentially get two lives in every boss fight. Unfortunately, sustaining damage in Umbral applies wither to your health, turning a portion of your health bar gray, requiring you to deal damage to an enemy in order to gain that withered health back without using an item. Also unfortunately, your Sanguinarix, which is your primary method of healing, only heals half as well in Umbral as it would in Axiom. Two last tidbits about the Umbral Realm and the Umbral Lantern. One, some areas in Axiom can only be progressed through using obstacles or bridges within the Umbral Realm. If you see a gathering of white moths somewhere, shine your Umbral Lantern on that spot to reveal something you should interact with or find a way to remove in the Umbral Realm. Be careful not to look into Umbral for too long, because Umbral enemies can see you while you're looking around, and if they hit you while you're shining the lantern, you'll get dragged into the Umbral realm against your will. You can manually enter Umbral whenever you want via the lantern, but to return to Axiom without dying, you'll have to use the rest function at any vestige or find an emergence effigy, which are found in a limited number in each area. The other thing, if it's been a while since you've seen a vestige, look for an Umbral flower bed. When you're near one, you'll see vines decorated with white flowers on the ground and your Umbral Lantern icon will flash. You can use an item called a Vestige Seedling, which can be found or bought throughout your adventure, to plant a Vestige in that flower bed, which can do everything a normal Vestige can. You can only have one planted Vestige active at a time, and because you really don't know when the next real Vestige or area shortcut will happen, you're almost guaranteed to waste your Vestige Seedlings every time. Your Umbral Lantern and Sanguinaris can be upgraded to improve their functionality and benefits, so as long as you're exploring and picking up every item you see, you'll have both fully upgraded in no time. Lords of the Fallen 2's combat, while being better than the previous game, still has its issues. Controls are much more responsive than the first game, which feels so, so good. But since they made the game noticeably more fast-paced than its predecessor, it feels... floaty. Enemy weapon swings will sometimes hit you even though they shouldn't because their attack swings will either slide them 20 feet to connect with you, or the attack itself will remain active even when the attack is over. That's another soul staple. Dying and then saying something to the effect of, how the fuck did that hit me? I feel like this was how the devs planned to make players really pay attention to enemy attack patterns and force the player to utilize the iframes you get during dodges, or to use the parry system. A mechanic I tried to like is the weapon combo mechanic where, whether you're dual wielding two different weapons or going from a one-handed grip to a two-handed grip on a weapon, you can change between the two mid-combo and use some cool looking combination moves. The caveat is, these moves take a lot of stamina and are damn near impossible to cancel out of, leaving you wide open to attack. Two-handing a weapon typically hits harder and has an easier time staggering enemies than single-handing or dual wielding weapons. Not to mention, the more clean and precise nature of two-handing a weapon makes it easier to work in your attacks between an enemy's attacks and be able to stop at a second's notice to dodge or parry because dual-wielding attack combos can easily get away from you and get you killed. 
Just like in Dark Souls, your ability to actually use a weapon or be effective with it depends on the stat requirements of that weapon in order to wield it properly, and the stat scaling of the weapon. Remember, you want to use weapons that scale with stats you have an abundance of. There were quite a few parts of Lords of the Fallen 2 that garnered criticism, such as the density of enemies in a lot of the areas of the game, the amount of health the constantly spawning Umbral enemies have, graphical glitches, stuttering, and things like that. Since the game's release, Hexworks has been hard at work squashing bugs and tweaking things in order to ensure the game is, you know, playable. And I can confirm it has gotten a bit better to play since launch. Enemy density was one of my main gripes about the game. A true Souls game may have one or two dozen enemies between one bonfire and the next, but Lords of the Fallen has enemies left, right, and center, up high, and down low, which made my initial playthrough feel like a tiring slog through each and every area I visited. After about 20 hours, I was praying for the end. Instead of each section of the game getting me excited about what weapons and armor I would find or what the next area might bring, the number of enemies I would have to fight through got to be so exhausting that after a certain point, I just ran around them all in order to make some kind of meaningful progress. Less of a bug and more of a personal grievance of mine is the game's navigation. You typically don't get any kind of map in a Soulsborne game. Lords of the Fallen 2 decided to give you a map for each area, but it's more akin to a greatest hits collage of sketches of statues or points of interest in the area, so not a map at all. Then there's the fast travel you can do between vestiges. Each ancient vestige location will have the name of the vestige, an accompanying location name that goes with it, a picture of where the vestige sits, and a little paragraph that fleshes out the relationship of that vestige to that location. All that is fine and dandy, but the few times I need to go to an exact location, I could never figure out what vestige would get me the closest to where I needed to be. This was especially frustrating when I had to locate an NPC that wandered off for a quest line, or when I had to find the sixth and final beacon to cleanse in the main story, because all you can do is get to higher ground, look out over the horizon to see what direction the red sky beam is in, and then try and figure out which vestige you've previously visited is closest to the beacon you're trying to get to. Lastly, the lock-on function, which is supposed to ensure your attacks target the specific enemy you want to attack, is very finicky. It seems to prioritize enemies far away from you rather than the enemy directly in front of you, and that's just not correct. Oh, there's also this game's version of Dark Souls' Covenants, which essentially boiled down to kill players in PvP or kill bosses in co-op to gain a special currency to add to the community bank and unlock special gear. I did my first playthrough entirely solo just to prove to myself that I could, and in New Game Plus, I decided to give co-op a shot. I joined someone's game and we just ran around doing what you'd usually do solo, killing what needs to be killed and trying not to lose our own lives in the process. The host of the session has control over access to Umbral, using emergence effigies, opening path shortcuts and picking up once per playthrough loot, but everyone gets vigor and any items drop by slain enemies. Usually in a Souls game when you die in co-op, you get booted back to your own world with whatever souls you gained. In this game, you just respawn along with the host and do the walk of shame back to wherever you guys died. It's nice to have someone to suffer with. If you beat Lords of the Fallen 2, which took me roughly 40 hours to do, you get the option to either start the harder New Game Plus 1 with all your items and character level, or restart the base difficulty playthrough with all your items and character level. The thing that really makes New Game Plus is harder, but also easier, is that the number of ancient vestiges are noticeably reduced, forcing you to rely more and more on vested seedlings. Whatever difficulty that provides, that still means you'll be less likely to use them unnecessarily. In my own opinion, I think that pulling the game from Deck 13, the developers of the first Lords of the Fallen, was the worst thing that could have happened to the sequel. If anyone would have truly understood where the first game lacked and how it could be improved, it would have been Deck 13. The Umber Realm and the Lantern were definitely unique additions to the tried and true Souls formula, but that's where I feel this game's individuality ends. Either way, with the fixes and changes still to come, and the free additional content that's on the way, Hexworks is doing their best to round out the experience and keep players coming back. I wish them luck. Have you ever heard the fairy tale about a mischievous wooden puppet? All of Krat knows the story. All because of someone who loved that story more than anyone else. Ah, but this is strange. I, I do not recall... Who exactly was that someone? On to our next subject. 
Liza P was announced on May 19th, 2021 by South Korean developer and publisher NeoWiz. Director Jiwon Choi stated the game had been in development for about three years and the studio chose Pinocchio as the theme in order to appeal to a wider fanbase. Jiwon Choi notes that the original story of Pinocchio has a dark tone and diverse backgrounds that the staff could naturally use. They chose to set the game in a Belle Epoque-esque environment in order to properly encapsulate a city's transformation from opulence to ruin and convey a period of unparalleled cultural and artistic prosperity, yet severe darkness and negativity. Right off the bat, they nailed a solid aesthetic choice and the accompanying atmosphere. Now, what did they do with it? Lies of P starts you off by having you select a combat style, which they are, but also aren't. I'll explain more in a second. Basically, you can start strong and slow with a two-hand sword, lighter and quicker with a rapier, or a saber, which is more balanced between the two. I started with the saber just in case I needed to pivot stat-wise later on down the line. Once you select how you want to start, it only take maybe an hour or two at most to finish the starting sections, learning all the basics and fighting your first real boss, and then you end up at the main hub, Hotel Crop. That being said, the game doesn't really begin until you defeat Archbishop Andreas, who is the fourth boss of the game. By then, you should know how you want to play the game, where you want your stats to be, what weapons you want to use, and so on. I'll tell you what, once I got immersed in the game, it truly felt like Lies of P is the closest we're going to get to Bloodborne on PC. It's available on PlayStation and Xbox too, but my point still stands. Anyway, there are two unique elements in Liza P which your character, Timothy Chalamet, can use to overcome any and all threats. Your Legion Arm and your choice of weapon. Stat scaling is also a mechanic in this game, but the good news is you can wield any weapon you find right away since there's no minimum stat requirements to do so. Weapons can be found or bought as one assembled weapon. Liza P sees weapons as having two parts, the handle and the blade. A little ways into the game, you will find a tool you can bring to the blacksmith girl back at the hotel, which will allow her to disassemble the weapon, separate blade from handle. Do this to a bunch of weapons, and what do you have? Blades and handles you can mix and match at will. I'm an inventor! It doesn't let you get as creative as you'd hope, but it's still fun if you want to try some wacky weapon and handle combinations, like a knife blade on a greatsword handle. Your choice of handle determines how you will hold the weapon, how you will swing the weapon, and what stats the weapon will scale with. Your choice of blade determines how slow or quick the weapon swing or thrust will be, the damage type, since some blades have inherent elements, and the blade is also the part you upgrade in order to strengthen the attack power of the weapon, once you have the materials to do so. This brings us to Fable Arts. Your weapon's blade and handle each have an innate Fable Art that you can use, shown on the lower right, and will show you how much of your Fable gauge is required to use the Fable Art. Some Fable Arts can buff you, some will do a special attack, some will shield you from damage or provide a window of time you can use to parry an enemy's attacks. Fable Arts cannot be moved from one blade to another or one handle to another, but it still provides another layer to the mixing and matching of blades and handles that you can do. Next, we have the Legion Arm. As you might already know, Timothy Chalamet is Geppetto's finest puppet, appearing almost human, apart from his left arm, which is very much still puppet-like. You begin with a very rudimentary Legion Arm that can do a simple punch. I never used it. And after the starting section, you are made aware of more types of legion arms you will come to possess once you find the necessary item to unlock them. There's only an armful to choose from, but pretty much all of them have a role that they fill. The fire one is good for fleshy enemies like creatures or humans. The puppet string is good for yanking enemies to you or yourself to them. The acid or electric arms are good for killing inorganic enemies like puppets, and so on. My favorite is the Aegis because it looks dope and a shield that explodes once an enemy touches it is pretty handy. Actually, I lied. There are four unique elements to the game. Number three is the P organ system. The P organ is basically a skill tree of significant upgrades, each with two or more slots that must be filled with a rare material called quartz in order to activate the upgrade. Upgrades can do things like change how your dodge works, make parries easier to pull off, add additional usable item slots, add additional pulse cells, which are your primary method of healing, or even add another legion arm slot. Slotting quartz also applies a lesser but still very useful passive upgrade to greatly assist you in combat, like increasing the amount that pulse cells heal, making consumable buffs last longer, or providing buffs when your weapon durability hits certain thresholds. Yes, weapons have durability, and you are given a grindstone to fix your weapons on the fly, but not only is it never a big deal, 
there are P-Organ upgrades and amulets that make it even less of an issue, so you don't have to worry about it. Whether you're just tossing in a quartz or activating a whole upgrade, it's still going to make a big difference in combat, so try to make smart choices depending on your playstyle. Should your playstyle change down the line, you eventually get the chance to reset your P-Organ and reallocate your quartz however you like. The last unique element of Lies of P, and perhaps the most important, your lies. Puppets are not allowed to lie, which is the fourth law of the Grand Covenant, essentially a rulebook which gets imprinted within all automated puppets once they are constructed. Timothy is, as everyone keeps saying, a very special boy, because he is able to lie. Dialogue with different characters will sometimes make you choose between a direct and cold choice, basically the truth, or an attempt to spare a person's feelings by obscuring the truth, basically a lie. The more Timothy lies, the more his body will change and the more human he will appear to others, the most prominent change being his hair. Not to mention, I was annoyed that this cat that lives in the hotel would never let me pet him, only to realize it doesn't let puppets pet him. Oh, I mentioned amulets earlier. Timothy can equip amulets and install defensive parts to provide more benefits in combat. Amulets can provide bonuses like increases to certain stats or things like gradual health regeneration and defense parts can provide you guessed it, defense, against certain types of damage. Amulets, defense parts, weapons, and legion arms all have weights which need to be accounted for so you don't become over-encumbered. Combat in Lies of P is slow and methodical. Every attack hurts and you'll be punished if you panic roll away from enemies. You can guard with any weapon, which has you take a bit of actual damage and something creatively called guard regain, which is health that you lost due to guarding that can be regained by attacking the enemy. If you guard at the perfect time, you initiate a perfect guard, which negates all damage you would have taken, instead just reducing your stamina. Perfect guards, parries via fable arts, and attacks of any kind wear down enemies and once their health bar flashes a white border, hit them with a heavy attack to stagger them, which then opens them up to a fatal attack, dealing massive damage. Each weapon blade has its own stagger attack, with heavier blades having more and lighter blades having less. Dodges have iframes so you can sidestep around earth shattering attacks once you know them. When enemies glow red prior to an attack, iframes will not work, so you will need to perfect guard, parry, or straight up run out of range of the attack. As for how the combat mechanics flow together, once you know the ins and outs of your weapon and have a basic understanding of enemy attacks, you'll be okay. Oh, before I forget. In this game, as well as Lords of the Fallen 2, walls or unbreakable obstacles will interrupt your weapon swings and it will get you killed. Surprisingly, it only happened once or twice in Lords of the Fallen since most attacks whiff through walls anyway, but in Lies of P, if you do a wide swing in a narrow corridor, your attack will bounce off the wall, but the enemy's attacks will not, so be careful. There is currently no co-op in Lies of P. I'm saying currently because I remember when Ghosts of Tsushima, a single player game, sprung a whole ass co-op expansion out of thin air that time. If you need help on a boss, you can use Star Fragments, which you can find all over the place, to summon a Spectre to fight alongside you. It's essentially a bot version of you that's more of a distraction for the boss than anything else. As with any co-op and a Souls-like boss battle, it makes it harder to tell who the boss is aiming their attack swings at, so I typically run solo. The nice part is that if you die in a boss fight, your Ergo, which is this game's version of Souls, will be dropped outside the boss room door, and that is a very welcome change from the norm. An unwelcome change is that for every time you get hit prior to picking up your dropped Ergo, you lose a portion of your dropped Ergo, meaning you can either run straight to your dropped Ergo to get it all back, or take your time and kill whatever stands between you and your dropped Ergo, having that much more of it when you finally recover what you dropped. Since I mentioned the poor navigation and sense of direction in Lords of the Fallen 2, I feel compelled to discuss how much better it is in Lies of P. The bonfires in Lies of P are called Stargazers, which you can use to rest and recover, switch legion arms, and a bunch of other things. Namely, fast travel to other Stargazers. The Stargazers are neatly categorized by region, given a name, and a picture for reference. Not once did I not know where I was going, whether I was walking or fast traveling. On top of that, if you need to talk to a specific NPC that is not at the hotel, or a quest item needs you to go to a certain location, an icon showing the NPC or the quest item will be placed next to the name of the stargazer your person or place is closest to. It's so simple, yet so significant. Dark Souls could even benefit from that. I took my sweet time in Liza P, finding all the equipment I could, completing all the quests I could, and enjoying every bit of it with my first playthrough completed after 38 hours. 
There is a New Game Plus mode that you can start directly after, where everything carries over except for key items and the supply boxes you can give to the merchants at the hotel to unlock more items to buy. You also gain access to an additional group of P-Organ upgrades to unlock, or you can reset your P-Organ entirely for an added challenge. Remember that Spongebob episode where King Neptune made a platter of like 100 Krabby Patties that were all bland? But Spongebob took all that time and care to make that one single perfect Krabby Patty? Lies of P is that Krabby Patty. I can't call Lords of the Fallen 2 a bad game, but I can't recommend it either. Whether it's by design or by accident, Lords of the Fallen is bigger, with 171 weapons, 32 shields, 88 armor sets, 64 magic spells, and a huge world to run around in. But it can't replace the heart and soul of a well thought out game, much less a well thought out Souls-like. It's quantity over quality, and Lords of the Fallen 2 does not, to me, have enough quality. On the other hand, Lies of P is smaller in scale and paced a little more slowly. There's a smaller number of areas to run around in, a modest number of weapons and equipment to find, a small collection of outfits to choose from, and less enemies to worry about. But the fewer options give rise to a much more refined experience, since each weapon, legion arm, trash enemy, or big boss was crafted with a clear purpose in mind, and everything comes together masterfully. Both games have their distinct positives and negatives, but at this point in time, Lords of the Fallen has more negatives than positives, and I feel like that is the most objective conclusion I can draw after having played both that and Lies of P from start to finish. Like I said earlier, I really think Lords of the Fallen 2 was doomed once development was taken from Deck 13, with the vision of the end product being clouded more and more each time the project got tossed to a different studio. If being better than Lords of the Fallen 1 was the bare minimum goal, I would say they nailed it. However, any accolades beyond that are up for debate. But that's just my two cents. Lords of the Fallen and Lies of P are both available now on the Playstations, the Xboxes, and PC. They were both just on sale, so I'm sure they'll be marked down again soon. Lies of P is worth every penny, but if I were you, I would wait for Lords of the Fallen to go on sale. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. This has been your Slayer of Lords and Master Puppeteer, Cygnus Jason, and I will catch you all on the game side.